I feel like we're gonna end up talking about this point pretty often in in the course of our conversations in the space, which is, you know, uh, well, I won't even, I won't ask like the main question, I'll just sort of like say what, what I was just thinking of. So it speaks to, again, like what is art, right? And so in my definition, um, art is something that however it's made, whoever it's made by, you know, and for whatever purpose, I guess it gets a little shaky there. It comes through the lens of a human observer. Like it comes through the, it is, it is, uh, you know, alchemized or transmuted through like the perspective that a human being has Mm -hmm. on this world or this reality. And so I think fundamentally, again, this is just my take on it. Um, that is not reproducible by, um, you know, an AI or, or anything else. I mean, and again, I, I suppose that that does beg the question of what you said earlier of like, well, the programmer, but I don't think that, I mean, it's a really interesting question, right? Because then if you set up a piece of installation art, you know, and it's like you've like left a prism, you know, or whatever, and then like whatever the sun is doing, like, so in a sense, you are indirectly continuing to create art, even though you're not there, or, you know, people do stuff with like music and noise, or, you know, they record samples of it. So I think for me, art is created by the interaction between human consciousness and nature. Solid. So yeah, um, let's see. We have NFTs, uh, art by AI, which I encountered in my little brief foray into the world of NFTs, which made me sick to my stomach in so many ways, so many ways. I encountered these pieces, I don't even want to call them that, that were being sold for like 500,000 to a million dollars and it was art made by an AI Mm -hmm. in under two minutes from inputting a word or phrase. So you put in a word or phrase Mm -hmm. and this algorithm or AI generates this artwork, heavy, Mm -hmm. heavy quotes. Um, Mm -hmm. And I mean, it was by far the highest, you know, price that was, being uh you know asked for anything that i saw on on this like nft marketplace and so Mm -hmm. i just kind of like cocked my head and thought about it like what what is that saying you know like what kind of a statement does that make that like oh the highest value item is this thing that was generated by a computer in under two minutes from a phrase uh versus like i don't know i so that's that's just that's something yeah see it's it's weird because to me the value in that because i don't think the end product is really the value i think the value in that is the programmer who made that thing possible right but when you're purchasing that thing you're not purchasing the program you're purchasing the end product and the end product sounds like it's kind of a piece of garbage so Mm -hmm. Oh, most of them were. It's a there weird. Was one val- good- it's a weird valuation system for people to use to 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 misunderstand. To me, to misunderstand the end product for the real value which came in the process of, of yeah. setting it. I mean, it's like you know, <laughs> it's a bad analogy, but or maybe not a, just not a great analogy. But I'm in Seattle. One of our big local artists is J- Dale Chihuly, the glass artist. Mm-hmm. He's got studios all over the Pacific Northwest, the Puget Sound area, the Glass Museum down in Tacoma, etc. Um, a lot of the stuff that his he's been doing over the last probably 20 years or so is mostly has to do with the fact that he's got studios set up and he's trained people to do essentially what he does. So when these installations get put in at, you know, an opera or wherever, 
um, you know, somebody's building a new thing in the last five years and they put a Chihuly in the lobby, they're buying, they're paying all that for the end product. When really what, to me, the kind of interesting thing about Chihuly is he's done a really good job of creating a, uh, a process that, that turns out something that has kind of, to me, relatively low value on its own, other than it probably looks better than the NFT in the lobby of a opera house or something. But really, it's all about the fact that he's made this process. And I know there's people who complain about him being kind of a bad guy to work for, and I don't know anything firsthand about that. It's just you know hearsay. But the parallel between the process being kind of the real value and I, versus the, this final product, I, I, I think that goes back to that people are kind of missing the point. Because if you look at, at Chihuly, he's not really trying to, in my opinion, communicate something about his particular worldview in a unique way time and time again. He's kind of got a little niche and he's running with it. So is he, what is he, is he really making art? I think in and of itself, not really. I think in the context of a nice architectural place, you know, cause I think architecture is a really cool art form. Um, but in the right architectural space, it can add an air of, uh, uh, kind of, uh, gravitas that can, can help, uh, uh, engender the artistic experience if somebody is, you know, coming into this architectural space and they just go, oh my gosh, look at this whole thing. Who designed this? And, oh, why did they do that? And this and all this other stuff and this glass piece. Why did they choose that? Yeah, you can have an artistic experience with the architecture that way. But to me, it's less about the that one thing because that's kind of a, I don't say it's a factory process, but it's a, it's a product. So that's my two cents, I guess. <laughs> I think it's really funny that his name sounds like patchouli, but scrambled up. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know. It's like an artistic hippie starter pack. <laughs> Chihuly patchouli. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I always notice right. shit like that. Um, yeah. And the, uh, yeah. The <laughs> art by AI is a. I mean, it, it hits me extra hard, you know, because it's like, I feel like the way that working class people feel when they get replaced by robots of mm -hmm. like, oh, well, you know, you kind of were well, you were useful until we found a way that, you know, had better margins. And like, you know, we just don't have to actually take care of any humans or meet anyone's needs. Um, so in that sense, it's like, you know, I don't know, as an artist, it's like, what the, what the fuck am I? I chopped liver, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And how and quickly... Yeah. How, anyway, how it, is quickly. it, is it, you know, are, do you have to be a part of the technocratic system? Because if it's, it's, if it's an option that people can take, if they want, I'm fine with that. Right. When it comes down to forcing everybody into that. Okay. Can I be an artist who doesn't do that? Who do, isn't involved in that system? If so, now great. I'll just stay the hell out of it. Yeah. Well, and, and that's and, kind of the thing. If it's, if, 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 and it's tough with, with art, because it's kind of, you know, the perception of the community that drives the valuation. But, you know, as, as long as there's no, like, forced coercion to be, like, the only thing that are, I, I don't know. And so it's kind of a public uh, opinion perception kind of thing. But um, ah, that's a tricky question. It's a, it's a, <laughs> well, I wanted Nobody's to say, without a... Without reviving, I mean, I feel like we're going to end up talking about this point pretty often in in the course of our conversations in this space, which is, you know, uh, well, I won't even, I won't ask like, the main question. I'll just sort of like say what, what I was just thinking of. So it speaks to, again, like what is art, right? And so in my definition, um, art is something that however it's made whoever it's made by you know and for whatever purpose i guess it gets a little shaky there it comes through the lens of a human observer like it comes through the it is it is al al, you know alchemized or transmuted through like the perspective that a human being has mm -hmm. on this world or this reality mm -hmm. and so i think fundamentally again this is just my take on it um that is not 
reproducible by, um, you know, an AI or, or anything else. I mean, and again, I, I suppose that that does beg the question of what you said earlier of like, well, the programmer, but I don't think that, I mean, it's a really interesting question, right? Because then if you set up a piece of installation art, you know, and it's like, you've like left a prism, you know, or whatever. And then like, whatever the sun is doing, like, so in a sense, you are indirectly continuing to create art, even though you're not there, or, you know, people do stuff with like music and noise, or, you know, they record samples of it. So I think for me, art is created by the interaction between human consciousness and nature. And so when you take either one of those things fully out of the equation, it becomes something else. It becomes a product, right? Because the purpose, you know, because, because, um, it's kind of like the distinction between, um, experimentation and free, you know, free exploration and, um, like research and development, like R and D, you know, kind of like, you know, like the difference between, I don't know, for example, like this is a really fucking weird analogy, but you know, some kids like run around killing squirrels when they're kids, right? But they're not, most of them, like they're not doing research. Like they don't have a notebook back home where they're like, okay, so when I did this, you know, I vivisected this squirrel. Whereas a pharmaceutical company, they're systematically exposing rodents and God only knows what else to all these different mm -hmm. things. And they're like, and they have this end goal, this very like aramonic mechanized end goal where they're literally like studying and there is in this case nefarious i guess not necessarily nefarious end goal of like well we want to understand how all of this works so we can like more you know precisely mm -hmm. control mm -hmm. it and manipulate mm -hmm. it and and monetize it or whatever and that's and true predict it and so and that's what i mean i just think when you bring in something like ai it's like because you can't guarantee that that data won't go get fed into some thing, you know, it's that. So that's, I just wanted to make that statement. It's yeah. Like, yeah. And, 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 you know, that's what I think it's important for people to understand in the, the whole conversation around this is that at the end of the day, the AI is creating it, but the AI is contingent on the programmers. And right. so, and, and I, I have some kind of real world examples I'll get to, but like really anything like that is only, you know, if you think the AI, uh, I shouldn't say it that way. The the idea that the AI is creating it is a partial misnomer because right. it has to do with the program. And then when you talk about AI and what you were kind of leaning into was the, you know, that th th this AI is simulating a human based on this massive data collection that's been going on for the last 20 years right? about what a human is and how we think and feel and respond. So the AI is simulating a human intelligence which is disturbing but <laughs> really it's only doing it along whatever algorithmic protocol it is designed to do it so you have to look at the programmer level to see if there's any art or uh, you know necromancy or 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 spell crafting or black magic going on you know mm -hmm. and i hate to put you find a point on it but i think at the end of the day that's you really have to the end product, that AI painting, that's just that's just a smokescreen. And what's right. really going on, the real creation, whether it's art or whether it's something more sinister, you count you have to look at the at the level of who are the programmers and why are they programming it. And then you can start to see, I think, into what kind of person would have that worldview that would create such a thing in the first place. And that's where you start to learn about the differences in human perception and human worldview based on our choices and the things that have formed us, et cetera. So when you start to break to that level, you can start to ask questions that then get you closer to understanding somebody else's uh, perception and their reality and their worldview. So hmm. that's where I would go with that. Yeah. I mean, um, I think I, I've just was, as you were saying that I was thinking about it, I, I realized like how indistinct my views on it are because it's such a new thing. You know what I mean? It's like, what? Mm -hmm. you have to kind of like, trepanate your skull to make room for like the additional reality yeah, in a way yeah. like it's like oh i God. never thought i would uh i would grow to see this i got a couple th i got a couple like uh, things that i could kind of 
give us kind of interesting ideas or examples kind of along these lines, things that I've uh, experienced here. First, this idea, I'll just kind of put this out there. This idea kind of came to me while you were talking about, you know, programming AI and stuff. And it makes me wonder with the education system and the fact that art is not taught really at all. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of leads me to think about the artist in the modern context as kind of a programmable instrument to begin with. And I say that Whoa. because, you know, how do you, you know, if you're a fashion designer or something, how do you make it big? You go on Project Runway or whatever that show right. is. You know, there's, <laughs> you, you, you cater to some sort of corporate uh, success model and pander and play to, et cetera. Right. Um, and I, I, you know, hate to pick on fashion designers, but I, I, I just, that's it. just the first example of many. I mean, it's... There's glass blowing reality TV competition shows now. I mean, whatever you want. Um, and, you know, as a writer, you can look at, yeah, you can, you can, you know, toil, toil away on the great American novel, or you can just go Clive Cussler or Dean Koontz or whoever and just bang him out. Just do the follow the model. Right. Um, so, you know, and, and, people are fairly programmable to begin with. So, I, I, that just kind of made me think. But, so I've had some experiences in terms of approaching this uh, uh, line of thinking about AI creating art, um, particularly as I uh, was reading through some of the work of Douglas Hofstadter, who uh, I think has got some very interesting stuff that he talks about in some of his books. Um, but being an early uh, guy around computer programming and kind of early AI, I think he's one who thought all along and I don't know now, but I think, you know, in the eighties, he probably would have thought AI is a nice idea, but I don't think it's really something that we can ever really get to. I think the human mind is just really too complex to get something that's actually really what is ideal platonic artificial intelligence. Nonetheless, he was very interested and would go around. He was a college professor and would go around to different, you know, computer uh, uh, universities with these fledgling computer programming departments in the 80s and stuff. And they would always try and stump him or put on games and stuff for him. And one of the things that was very popular uh, was to program uh, something that would create a poem. So program, uh, make a computer program mm. that would create a poem. And then you tr bring that poem in front of somebody like Douglas Hofstetter and say, did a person write this? Or did a program right. write this? And so it's kind of a Turing test, but with the poetry sort of uh, angle to it. But so that, that uh, as I read that years ago, uh, I can't remember what one of his books, it might've been a metamagical famous. Anyway, um, him talking about that and it made me think. Uh, uh, and, and so I started and, and ended up basically writing a set of 12 poems. You the, did? I, yeah, the idea of which was I was going to try and write 12 poems and be able to put them in front of somebody and say, so I made this computer program and it made these 12 poems. Tell me what you think. Wow. And see if I could trick people into believing that I made a computer program that created these poems. So I had to think like a person who had to think like a machine thinking like a person in order to, to, to create these poems. It was a really fun exercise. Um so, you know, that was my kind of experience with coming to my first contact with artificial intelligence and its interaction with art was, well, how could I go back and refool the system and try and make something that's interesting and riffing on something that I think is problematic? And like, you know, so so that was my way of, of exploring that. Um, and I was like, like I said, it was a really fun exercise to, to, to do as a writer. Um, you were and, reverse engineering the process yeah. of reverse engineering. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was just a fun uh, thing to do to, to give myself something to kind of work on as a writer for, for a while. Um, and so the, then there's this other thing that this is just kind of like, and here's why we ultimately don't need AI for this. There's a farmer's market in my neighborhood. And oftentimes during the summer, the West Seattle Historical Society will have a little tent and they'll, they've got a little like museum-y thing and they'll promote whatever's going on. And uh, very frequently during the summer, there's a guy who sets up a little folding table and he's got a typewriter and he takes uh, eight by 11 pieces of paper and rips them in half. So they're 
what would that be? Not, you know, this way. So they're half, half size, not long wise, hamburger wise. Um, and then he'll roll that into his typewriter and you come up to him and he, he, he has a little sign that says five minute poems. And so you basically come up to him and he says, oh, what's your name? All right. What do you want the poem to be? You know, just give me something to go with. And so, you know, you say, you know, a sunset or whatever. And he's, you know, type, 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 type. Here, there's your poem. And you take it and you go along your way. And he's got a tip jar if you want to tip him. But he just sits there and does it. And it's a really neat thing to be like, we don't need AI. We got people like that. And there's a lot of those people like that if they thought to do something like that. So it's like, why do we even need AI? We got somebody that would be willing to create something interesting like that on the fly in a comparable amount of time. That's probably way more personal and interesting, gives you a more dynamic experience. Is that necessarily a work of art? Maybe it is to you when you look back later and reminisce about that, or you you really look at the concept that that person took and, and, you know, just meeting them for a moment and having them, you know, you say Ernest Hemingway and they give you this poem and you go, oh, this is what this person understands about Hemingway or what they think about Hemingway or, or their conception. And you can kind of start to get into what is that person like? What is the writer like? Who you just met for a second. And so, yeah, you have a little artistic experience perhaps around that. But if nothing else, it's an interesting conversation piece. You know, you put it in a frame and friends come over and they'll say, yeah, this is the poem that that guy, you should go down to the farmer's market. And he'll write you a poem. It's really, a, you know, so it's just a neat experience as well to, to share things like that. But, that's oh, we don't need AI. That's way more interesting than look at this piece of crap that uh, a computer made for me. And people are like, oh, okay, I guess I'm supposed to think that's interesting, right? Yeah, and and I have to say, it was there was a certain when I was looking at these, and I can send you a few. Uh, man, it would be, yeah, it would be good actually to put these up. Yeah, I'll put them. Yeah, send them to me after all. Um, yeah, like and they them. just looked like um, a lot of them looked very like Salvador Dali esque. But, like, again, there was no, you know, with Salvador Dali, like, you know, the amount of, like, thought and painstaking care that went into actually making that, like, mm -hmm. painting it mm -hmm. that well. Like, this man mm -hmm. was, like, I don't know, whatever beyond virtuosic, like, painter. Like, you know, he, I mean, he could do anything, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, he for better or for worse was like furiously masturbating for most of his life. So I think that's why he made certain things that he made, but nonetheless, like that is a unique one of a kind human being. And, and, and so just, I guess that was one of the things that really rubbed me the wrong way was I was like, you can't just, you know, you can't just commodify like this, like this unrepeatable artistry. Like you said, it's about the person. It's about that specific person who made it, you know, no one can make it quite like that. And now you have this algorithm that's like, yeah, put in a phrase, you know, like I'll, 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 uh, dolly it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't know, whatever the algorithm was to make those, I was like, wow, you really, you really went heavy on the Salvador Dali. You know what I mean? Like that's. And it makes me wonder too, is there like, could you turn, is there a exactly. tuner in the program? Let's turn the Matee up and, and the Dolly exactly. down and maybe a little right. Gogan or. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 that's kind of my suspicion. But, and then um, that kind of, that was something that, that Hofstetter talked about too, is, is people trying to create programs to like, not just create a poem, but like, Oh, I mean, look, like it's a lost Shakespeare sonnet. Right. Could you tell the difference between a lost Shakespeare sonnet and a computer generated Shakespeare sonnet? Because then you get into like the precise, uh, uh, you know, mechanics and, and, and technique of, of that particular writer, which, you know, most writers, Shakespeare might be a bad example because he was probably not just one person, but um, the person they tell us that he was definitely not the person they tell us he was. He was about as literate as Mohammed. Sorry for all of our Muslim listeners. Um, Anyway, uh, and I guess all of our listeners from Stratford and the Lake, uh, the Cotswolds. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, but but you know, you get a certain you know Edgar Allan Poe has a certain style, uh, mm -hmm. you know, different people, and so that's a little more uh, programmable. But the whole idea, and so as I could see it, be like, oh, let's make it Dolly like or whatever. But yeah, the idea that like the AI is just like this is what generic artists would think if you right exactly well, that would be interesting to me. But it's not interesting to the final product's not interesting. What's interesting is what gets you there. What's the, yeah, what's the going process. on inside the black box of the computer program? That's what would interest me anyway. Well, 
I don't know. The other, just to say one last thing. The other thing is there was a distinct creepiness to this art. Sure. And I will say, you know, uh, uh, this is my disclaimer. Like, yeah, it might be because I knew that an AI had made it. But even if I didn't, if I didn't know, I would have been like, this person is fucking disturbed. Mm -hmm. Like, they are... They are an emotionless automaton because it's just, it has this very, like, it has the, the emotional, I shouldn't even use that word. It has like the flavor of like, like a very sociopathic, like, just like, this, hmm, this what is what I think people feel like. I'll yeah, behave the way I think people exactly. will behave. Like, per like performing yeah. emotion. And like I said, it's like that research thing of like, oh, well, if I show you this, ah, uh, yes, you are smiling. And I detect changes in micro expression. Yep. Beep, bop, boop. Like, I will use this to refine further data. And the other thing, too, this is interesting, is based on how well, I'm sure this is not beyond their ability to do, based on how well any one of those, because it's all blockchain now, so you have, like, full, uh, whatever you want to call it, I guess, I don't know the terminology that well, but full sort of horizontal tracking right. wherever it ends up. Who, you know what I'm saying? Because it's all digital. And so, you know, they can feed the sort of results of this NFT being bidded on, who it was viewed by, all these things can get, somehow get fed back into that algorithm. Right, right. So it's to, in that to make, sense, it, to make it more, to make it yeah. better next time. Yeah, yeah. And that's why yeah. I feel like, you know, and maybe this is better. a personal thing for me, but I think that then becomes marketing. Because yeah. that's what yeah. marketing yeah. does. Marketing that's is an like, excellent point. you know, marketing is like the sniveling little, speaking of Shakespeare, it's like the Jew in every Shakespeare play that's yeah. like, ah, yes, how do I, ah, you know, like, how do I like make this better for me by like studying everyone, you know? And so, and, 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 and not, again, yeah. I, 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 I don't, I don't want to upset anybody, but Shakespeare's Jewish characters, perhaps for that one Shylock speech from the Merchant of Verona. They're pretty caricature, pretty out there character. So, so what Boris is saying is that he's not really that far off from like how Shakespeare portrayed Jews by and large in his in the work. Well, and yeah, I'm I mean, I mean, damn, we're getting like we're, we're getting <laughs> just saying. we're getting sucked into a Shakespearean blind alley. This was not That's planned. True. That's just not no. But I just we'll wanted all of that out. Have you heard the theory that Shakespeare was this Italian guy? Yeah. It's really interesting because, I mean, his plays are so Italian. Like, most of them take place well, in Italy or a very, like, Italy-type climate. I don't know. It's just interesting. And that's why, I, that's why I say I don't think it was one person. Because um, like, what about that's Oedipus? true. Is, where does Oedipus take place? Is it specified? Oedipus like, is, is Greece, but Oedipus was Sophocles. That's who that was? Oedipus was written by Sophocles. Like... 500 bc or something oh okay then what the fuck is hamlet i'm thinking of hamlet wow so hamlet was set so hamlet was set in the netherlands or denmark right excuse me makes sense denmark makes sense um and then you know the scottish play not i'm in a theater i can say Macbeth. Macbeth was set in scotland uh the all the war of the roses plays the henry's and the richards that's all english history so there's a lot of different elements so you've got the yeah you've got all the Italian plays, but then you've also got like Andronicus and some of the reflective Greek histories, and that was probably a different person working with. I think ultimately Francis Bacon was kind of yeah the, right the head so, of the whole yeah, project right absolutely. Um, and I think where you see most of Bacon's influences outside of the uh, uh, revival Greek uh, plays like Andronicus and, and those um, are the uh, um, the history you know the Richards and the the uh, Henrys and the uh, Macbeths and the and the Hamlets and the King Lears and and those things you see a lot of, but yeah, like Much Ado About Nothing is a very different play. Merchants of Verona, uh, the uh, Venice play, mm -hmm. yeah, they're all very Italian plays. And so there's, I, I think there's at least three different. There's probably many more, but like right. three distinct kind of voices within Shakespeare's plays. Um, and I think they're amalgam of I can't remember the that Viscount or whatever. He was kind of a Italian dandy, you know, he ran around to Italy and was, you know, rich young kid. And so would have known how to write and would have been uh, around the theater. And I think he toured. Uh, I don't remember the whole story, but um, 
And that's kind of a distinct voice as opposed to somebody who's a lot more familiar with the ancient Greek, as opposed to somebody who's a lot more familiar with the middle age, uh, continental English history stuff. So, but then yeah. you've got stuff like, uh, the Tempest, which I mean, yeah, <laughs> I'm guessing that was Francis Bacon. John D might've been involved in that. Who knows? Right. Like, Definitely. They were all around. I, yeah, I, I like that John D idea. Yeah. The Tempest is one of the strangest pieces of literature. Well, it's a, it's a, it's or not much, di- it's not right much word. different from like, I don't know if you've seen Johnny Depp in the ninth gate or, so. uh, that's a real, that's a really good movie or, uh, even, uh, eyes wide shut. Um, it's called Johnny Depp in the ninth gate. No, it's called the ninth gate. Oh, in the, okay. It's just the ninth gate. Johnny Depp is the main character, the, the main actor. But it was Speaking a Roman of, Polanski movie. And I feel like we could review movies really well on this yeah, podcast oh or another one. Yeah. That would be because, oh, yeah. oh, I don't know if you sent me that book, the, the symbol language of film or whatever, but I definitely want to read that. And I just, yeah. um, I'm sorry, wait, you were saying uh, Roman Polanski. I just want to. Yeah, it's a Roman Polanski movie. It's called The Ninth Gate. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a great movie. Um, I have to write it down because I just made a movie list for somebody. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I put it on there, but I would definitely have to go on there. Anyway. So but, it's similar. Uh, it's like a crazy, well, like, well, this, here's, here's why I say that. It, it's also in the same vein. It's also not too dissimilar from eyes wide shut. The tempest is somebody telling you about a ritual. Huh? They're displaying right. a ritual in front of you. And so that's Wait. why I think there was some John D stuff in there, but I that's, read- you know, eyes wide shut was like, well, yeah. let's take a look at the satanic ritual and the ninth gate kind of centers around this weird ritual devil worship thing too. So it's, mm. it, it, it's not that they're a one-on-one mapping, but they kind of have, the, you know, I, I think the Tempest has a lot of like, let's, you know, occult ritual happening right on stage, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I read the Tempest, I think I read it in like high school. So, I mean, I can't say that it's fresh, but I was going to say, um, I feel like, the reason that when you said John D, my I kind of had like a light bulb moment was, isn't there? Didn't they say that John D was like instrumental in destroying the Spanish Armada? Have you heard about all of this? Yeah, like that he. There's something yeah. like um, he like went. I just I. Oh man, I feel like I'm brain dead right now just because I'm a little under the weather. Basically, he went out to this like place in Prague these like seven hills or something. It's like this energetic, like Mm vortex. I mean, Eastern Europe has a lot of like crazy Mm -hmm. mystical shit, you know, Mm -hmm. like especially that sort of region. There's a lot of like really special places. Um, So he went out there and he, I think this was around the time that he was doing that thing with uh, Edward Kelly, with the Enochian and the, the, the angel language. So he was already sort of getting instructions from these, from the beyond, you know, wheels of eyes. And they said they saw God and God bellowed like a whale anyway, but I digress. So, so yeah, so he went out and he essentially, yeah, he like conjured and or directed this storm to wipe out the Spanish armada. And it really, Mm -hmm. I feel like the reason that I bring this up or the reason it's so interesting to me is like, it definitely seems like there was a lot of like, social and geomantical engineering going on in this time of like Elizabethan England and Francis Bake. You know what I mean? Like, like, so it just, it's interesting because it makes me be like, wow, like this stuff that they're doing now really is not that new. They just had to use different methods. Do you know, do you know Michael Wan? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's where, yeah. His whole Susquehanna alchemy 400 year ritual 1620 jamestown uh research is just absolutely fascinating to yeah it's out of this world and he's up in your area so i figured you might have heard of him yeah yeah i, I actually saw his stuff um i want to say around may mm-hmm. and i was like whoa because he was a guest on uh the higher side chats mm-hmm. uh, yeah uh, yeah, I was like, whoa. He, yeah, yeah, I, got, he I got referred to him by somebody I was in Passio's class with. Like, oh, you should check this out. I was like, oh, cool. But yeah, he's a he's a interesting. He's a great storyteller, if nothing else. If nothing else. And I think that's what he, he would say that he is, first and foremost, as a storyteller. Right. And so to approach funny- him from that that vein he's I, I i think he's really really like storytelling is not an easy thing and he's really really good at it 
And then some of his research and stuff is just fucking fascinating. Yeah, it really is. I agree. Um, yeah, that's just a really interesting subject. And I feel like it takes a, it does take a great mind to sort of do both pieces of that, like put all the, put all the pieces together and then be able to present it in like a cohesive way that other mm-hmm. people can sort of absorb. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess you're going to hack at this later anyway. Let me but, just... but anyway, I just going back to, I know I keep, I keep wandering us off course or we get off course. Anyway, uh, I, I think the whole thing that it comes back to, as we were talking about um, um, this whole process of making uh, a machine, that's this like, you know, sociopathic, trying to, to, to make a simulacrum of what it thinks that humans would, would be like if it were a uh, human too. Um, it goes back to kind of that initial, the initial alchemy of evil, which is that initial perversion of nature, you know, and this is what the whole, this is why I think I, it's important to talk about art because art is at the core of one of the most fundamental forces in nature, which is communication. You know, the, uh, trees communicate through their root systems. Mushrooms communicate through their, the uh, whatever their root systems are called. I don't think they're called root systems. But anyway. My, mycelium, mycelium. Yeah, they're mycelium networks. And, and you know, birds communicate and dolphins, you know, I saw somebody there, they're, they're uh, using uh, semantics, uh, somatics, not semantics, somatics. Uh, uh, playing dolphin sounds and shape and, 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 and seeing what shapes the water takes in order to form a somatic dolphin alphabet. Which, uh, but, but like all of the stuff, this communication this is all happening all around us. And, and, and on the electromagnetic level, you know, you, you see somebody you haven't seen in a while that you really like, and you feel it in your heart, you get that rush of energy, you know, all that stuff is how we communicate. And so all of this stuff is important because this art is one of those things that has to be perverted because they have to pervert our community, our ability to communicate with each other. And one of the biggest mediums that we have is through art. And so to, to, to turn that into the psychopathic simulacrum is to make that nature perverted. And then they're trying to repackage it back to us. And that's the whole thing is you take something natural, take it away from the person, you alter it and you give it back, you know, you give back the Frankenstein lump of whatever and tell them that it's the actual thing. And that's, you know, step one of alchemy of evil right there. Take the natural, pervert it, and give it back to sell it back, give it back, make a profit, returning it to them. Wow. And that's I, that's essentially that's the art. That's that's what's been going on in art is and yeah, the the AI thing is just the you know, that's the next transhumanist technocratic step to that. But yeah, it comes back to perversion of nature. That's the whole, you know, talk about Satanism. It's really to me about that which would pervert, which is natural and if you know that's satan is the right word to fit that okay fine i don't know if there's a right word to fit that but that's why it's important to me is because this is something sacred communication is something sacred and anything trying to perverse that uh, pervert that natural sacred thing is not somebody i want around (laughs) yeah well yeah, I don't. I can't really add much to that. You just like kind of, you, you got it all. Um, but yeah, I will say it seems like they believe in in Satan or something like it. Because yeah, know, yeah, they're they're yeah. they're given all this. You know, it's all going to that. You know, um, I think it's interesting. Just I was thinking about this yesterday. The Joseph P. Farrell book, like, it's almost it's almost seeming like like none of these entities per se are real in and of themselves until they're able to sort of siphon belief, you know, or, or, or like the power of human consciousness. And it's that, that uh, manifestational ability of people through their putting their energy into things, images, you know, etc. cetera, um, that, that makes these things real. And I just think it's interesting because when you look at something like what is presented to us as Satanism, you know, or whatever, this sort of like, you know, really dark occult, like, uh, type stuff, it is this lineage that's gone back for such a long time. And, and actually this connects with what you were saying about how 
a lot of these symbols, like these ancient symbols that meant something totally different, like the swastika, for example, you know, and then they, what they do is they, t and it's really interesting if you think about like the Q phenomenon, which is like, everything's bad, everyone's a pedophile, everything's satanic. And it's just really interesting that, you know, again, it's the same sort of um, strategy of like, well, we'll just make everyone basically dismiss and hate on every like so charging all of these ideas and mm -hmm. images with negative energy mm -hmm. it is i think that you know maybe that's not necessarily an inversion or a perversion of nature but it is a disempowerment because it's like you know there is a certain freedom with which we can interact with these symbol languages and i think the power and the meaning that these symbols take on over time is something that we put into them mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. thinking believing energy weaving you know race of beings and um and i think that i just think that's really a fascinating thing to to sort of turn over in your mind of like well do these meanings do these symbols rather have you know inherent meaning and we could go into cymatics we could go into sacred geometry etc you know or is their meaning sort of more or less malleable and i think that that has to be at least a little bit true mm -hmm. because of just how you see some of this stuff evolving through time and again the, mm -hmm. the q thing you know it's like no every spiral is like you know mm -hmm. you know pedophilia and it's like, <laughs> what like like literally people will be like oh that, that logo has a spiral and it's like a spiral is also a really fundamental shape mm -hmm. in the creation like what do you mm -hmm. you know or like oh it's a triangle it's like yeah yeah that's not <laughs> triangles, are, triangles exist. It's, you know, it's, it's like a triangle. Like if you're, I don't know, architecturally. And, you know, so, so I, I, but then those same people, here's the other thing that's funny to me. Those same people will, you know, look at a hexagon, a hexagon and see the mm -hmm. star of David and see some sort of Zionist, you know, plot, which may be there, but it might be a hexagon, which is one of the most fundamental building blocks in the natural world. You know, honeycombs mm -hmm. are hexagons. Uh, fibers and plants are all hexagonal. You know, the, the nature loves hexagons. It's the most, uh, uh, I think, what is it? The most efficient, strongest building uh, uh, formation, mm -hmm. you know, as yeah. far as like size to, to pressure ability. I, I don't know the exact wording, but mm -hmm. that's why it's so useful. And that's why nature uses it all the time. And so you could say, yeah, it's always the Zionist agenda, but nature doesn't think that. Nature right. thinks this is an effective shape to be building in the six-sided thing. Nature's not saying, oh, there's also these six points on each side that aren't being noticed. And, no, oh, it's six-sided. That's 666 oh, blah, blah, or whatever. You know, it's you could read into it in different ways. And, yes, that same six-sided thing can mean different things in different contexts to different people. But, yeah, the whole thing of one symbol means one thing. I think that's what makes it easy for people to be manipulated by symbols is they mm -hmm. don't have the ability to say, maybe somebody else thinks of this symbol in a different way. And if they don't, you know, have the best of intentions, they might use that kind of symbol and somehow manipulate my understanding of the symbol in order to make me think something or bypass my critical thinking. Well, uh, that, that makes me think of um, like the Bible. And I guess maybe to, I don't, I've never really interacted with the Quran or, I mean, like, whatever, I, this is my disclaimer is like, I don't really know that much about any of this stuff, but mm. one thing I've observed in um, people's reactions to sort of hearing a different take on, you know, something they see as like this, like foundational sacred text is this, this literalism that has been engendered in people, right? Because when you have that style of literature, you know, of which the Bible is, is an example, you know, it's so deeply like allegorical. It's like mm -hmm. painting with words, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. very, very mystical, very esoteric. But then you have these people that are like, you know, they, they literally pick it apart and they're like, no, this means this and mm -hmm. only this. Mm -hmm. And like, you follow the book to the letter and it's like, mm -hmm. I mean, if this is the word of God, I feel like God wouldn't insult our intelligence by, you know, like giving you like, you know, it's like a, a, a game manual for Monopoly of like in this situation, do this. Otherwise, do you know, there's I don't know. That's not a very mystical thing to do. And uh, I just feel like it's really interesting because, you know, people really respond. I mean, some people, I guess, you know, are, are more open minded, but a lot of quote unquote, you know, Christians, like especially like the sort of, you know, Bible thumping fundamentalist Christians 
you know, they're really not open to like, oh, well, have you considered like, you know, that this is like a, a text on astrotheology yeah. and like it's actually telling you, you know, well, let's just let's just go ahead and think. Do you really think that that guy got swallowed by a whale or big fish or whatever and lived inside of it for three days and then just got spat out? Possible. Possible. Right. Might it have some deeper significance? Possible. But here's the thing about that and being brought up in the in the Protestant, you know, American Christian church, mm -hmm. I can definitely say this for sure. There is a lot of literalism, even in in Christians that are less fundamental and a little more what I would consider contemporary kind of, you know, Sunday Christians with electric guitars and whatnot. Um, but there's still literalism there. The funny thing is, historically speaking, it's fairly easy to trace back to when the Bible was made into a historical, to be understood historically, and it wasn't but maybe 150 years ago, uh, 160 years ago anyway. Uh, something like that. But that's also evidenced by the fact that most modern rabbinical scholars give very little credence to the idea that the Old Testament is fundamentally historically accurate. And most would probably go on to say that, if anything, it's mostly, if not entirely, allegorical. The, the, the Old Testament. Yeah, according to modern rabbinical scholars. Yeah, and that's why I, they, they don't really comment on the New Testament because it's not in their canon. <laughs> it's really interesting because uh, you know I found out recently that well, found out you know Wikipedia was involved. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> you know I don't want to make any uh, statements of absolute uh, you know, but um, yeah, I found out that uh, the oldest copy of the New Test, the oldest complete copy of the New Testament, the Septuagint, I believe, is almost between like 500 and a millennium older than the oldest copy of the Old Testament, like the Masoretic text. Like the New, the New Testament is older. Yeah, the, the oldest copy that they have of a complete New Testament is significantly, like, at least right, okay. five centuries older than the oldest right. complete copy right. of the Old Testament, right. which I just thought was fascinating. And again, I'm not, I don't want it's, this. That's, that's, that's a, it's true, but it's that's a very misleading. That's that's a very misleading way of, of, of phrasing it or uh, of. of well, you know what you know what what that makes me think, you know, so you're responding to that, I feel like. Well, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I, I, not you, but just generally, that is the case, because you're talking about the oldest complete, mm -hmm. right? So, the Old Testament that was compiled by rabbis in has the different ages. books, has different books in it than the Christian Old Testament. So, are we talking about the first complete Christian Old Testament or the first complete Old Testament of the Judaist tradition, which is older, but the idea of a complete Old Testament in Judaism at the time wouldn't have been accurate because in First and Second Temple Judaism, there was no Bible. There was Torah, and then there was Talmud. And Talmud was changing as different rabbis wrote and contributed to things, as different ideas were needed to be discussed. That's what Talmud was for was to talk about these theological ideas, whereas Torah, the five books, that was that was the source. But then Talmud was what was taught about the source. So the complete Old Testament is kind of a misnomer because in Jewish, in the first and second temple Judaism, the Old Testament wasn't really a thing. And if it was, it was kind of always changing with the Talmud. So that's a little misleading. But yes, definitely the New Testament, the 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 Christians under under uh, um, Constantine, they put together the New Testament before they assembled the Old Testament for sure, because they sat down and said Temple or uh, Nicene, uh, mm -hmm. what was it called? Uh, convention, uh, Council of Nicaea. Uh, Council of Nicaea. Thank you. Creed, uh, that's all I could think of. Uh, a Council of Nicaea, what books are going to be the basis of the new state religion? And then that was essentially what, what the New Testament was. 
And then they got around to saying, oh, yeah, we should also tie that back into how the prophecies of the Jews tie into this and the messianic, you know, the Judaism came in. Anyway, anyway, but that's uh, probably too much religious history for an art podcast. <laughs> I was going to say, are you one of these rabbinical scholars? Like, because you could have fooled me. No, I'm just a, <laughs> I'm just a, I just love comparative religion and mythologies and the histories of those things. And I've studied them for a long time. Cause after I, you know, kind of fell from grace with, with the Christian church, I was still interested in all the things about, you know, how should we be and, you know, what's right. And so I checked out other religions and I think, you know, they're all bits cobbled together, bits and pieces of, you know, truth with a bunch of deception and lies and half truths, but they're still interesting to study in their own rights to me. So. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. Um, yeah, it's hard for me. Well, I, yeah, maybe we should we should swerve away from. from well, and from an art stuff. standpoint, too, I love having a biblical background when looking at stuff like one of my favorite artists, Rubens. He mm -hmm. did so much biblical symbolism in his work. It's really neat to know some of the stories. And then as my big penchant for alchemy and how a lot of the stories of Rubens are in the stories in the cathedrals that were built you know, like Chartres with Christopher and, and uh, uh, Rubens has a huge panel of St. Christopher carrying Jesus over the, or the Christ child over the, over the river. And uh, anyway, so it's just all of these things tie in and you learn the symbol language a little bit better, or I got to learn the symbol language a little bit better from knowing some of those stories uh, in the, in the past. So that's how it also ties back into art for me. Yeah. You meant to that. Um, so no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's tough for me with all that stuff because I feel like it's easy for me to get sucked into, like, wait, should I be believing this? You know what I mean? Like, I am, I'm trying to study it from a more whatever perspective, but it definitely feels like, I don't know, especially for some reason, the Christian stuff, like, I vacillate because it's like people are just so passionate. It's like crazy. I'm like, mm -hmm. damn, like, you really believe the fuck out of this like i don't know I, I, and i've never been one to be like oh well most people believe this so that means it must be true mm -hmm. <laughs> you know or i should i should come around it's and not I don't how think, it is i don't think a lot of people especially and again my experience <clears throat> with christians a lot of the folks that remain strong christians well into adulthood aren't doing it necessarily because they think people around them are doing it. I've known people in my life who did it probably for a while because they thought everybody around them was doing it because that's what you do when you're, you know, married with two kids um, in the suburbs. Those people tend to get to a point where they just kind of stop going or fall off or have some sort of change direction. But the folks that survive well into adulthood, I think it has less to do with like, that's what they think is acceptable and more they have experience and they've got enough examples of confirmation bias, enough experience with the confirmation bias that they begin to see everything through that lens. And I'm not picking on Christians because everybody does it. Whatever your worldview is, if you are not aware of situations where you are invoking confirmation bias onto some set of, a new set of information or statistics or something, and you're doing that, then it starts to ingrain itself and you start to look, you start to find a quarter on the street every day because you're always walking around looking for a quarter, you know? So that's, it's always a slippery slope and that's why critical thinking is important. And that's why, uh, you know, it's important to be critically thinking about art. And that's, that's one of the things that it comes down to is something like that is with the AI and the NFT thing is, I think we've probably, <laughs> I've probably thought as much about this thing as the person who bought it. Like really thought about it. Like they're like, oh, that's novel. I've got a million dollars to blow. I'll put that on my wall and I'll show up Bob from next door. You don't have an AI NFT, Bob. I do. Cost me a million dollars, you son of a gun. You know, uh, so... But anyways, you that's, that's the confirmation bias then works into that as well. And uh, I think just critical to, thought goes away. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, 
Well, yeah, in episode one, we, we talked about the portfolio ification yeah, of art. Yeah. And I think the NFT, like, you know, this whole thing, like, yeah, an, an AI made this in two minutes. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's like this transhumanist wet dream. And actually this, so yeah, I, I, um, I have a thing on here. I don't know that I even necessarily know what the fuck I had in mind when I wrote this, but it sounds I'm, cool. I'm excited. And I feel like you'll, you'll. You will. Um, it's like jazz. This is jazz podcast. It right really now. is. Yeah, at its best. Um, I wrote art as a voodoo doll for mass consciousness. Okay. So, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. It's anyone, I'm writing this down for anyone's guess. Mass yeah. Consciousness. And I guess, you know, what mm. I think Boris may mm, have in mind. That's really good. Okay. Sorry. What? what, uh, what say again. What, no, listen, your, your guess is as good as mine, but I just, this is my little afterthought. What I think Boris ha may have had in mind, oh, boy, okay. asterisk, when he penned or, or screened this little note to himself, is that, you know, you, be, and, and I think this is largely because um, art is like the, you know, art is like the intracellular signaling of human consciousness, you know, because like words, that's a, that's a box. Words are boxes. So words in and of themselves, you want to get really crazy, are a perversion of this natural communication mechanism. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, yeah. Could go I yeah. could go down a little brief sidebar here of like, you know, I think there's a form of language that actually is the original language and it's paleo hebrew and if you look back all over the world you actually see these same glyphs coming up in the same period in history and they are very interesting and enigmatic and, and then also there's many stories in history like there was this scottish king or something that isolated these this okay so this this might be like an amalgamation of several stories i've heard but okay. something like this did happen this Scottish like king isolated these two boys on an island and the woman that was taking care of them was um, deaf and mute. Okay. So she didn't speak. She couldn't speak period. And uh, she took care of them when they were like little, you know, children and, and through boyhood. And then I guess at some point she died, you know, she was like a, you know, one of these like midwifey wet nurse, uh, mm -hmm. whatever to, mm -hmm figures and then eventually they that this kingdom whatever you know dispatched a little you know contingent to check on on these boys and they found them you know in impeccable health hunting you know whatever just like living like doing everything great and they spoke perfect paleo hebrew and the and the, there's like a little you know this this ruler you know like is quoted as he was like they spake good hebrew like they spake very good Hebrew. And so it's just interesting to me that like, even though like something like English, I mean, talk about perverted, you know, mm -hmm. English mm -hmm. is, it's really is quite a feat that we're able to do <laughs> what we're doing right now. And like, you know, the, the podcasting thing and really sort of air probably, out interesting ideas. Yeah. Probably have a lot to, uh, to be thankful again to, to Francis Bacon. <laughs> right. Yeah. He was like, we need to like add some shit to this dry, I don't know, or whatever. Yeah. There's not nearly enough words. I'm going to create a hundred million. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and put him in I, play. So, anyway. I just wanted to comment on like, um, the fact that, you know, if you go back early enough, you'll find that the symbol systems that are most, uh, fundamental, most ancient, they sort of arise organically. Like they are an emergent property of nature and they just, they just evolve. They sort of just like coalesce out of living and existing in the world. It just makes sense to use those symbols like, you know, Lascaux and the cave art and everything, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, well, like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, these 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 buffalo or the, you know these these ungulates to use a you know a technical term all the the sort of hoofed animals that they were hunting for food and stuff mm -hmm. it's like that was they didn't need all of these words to talk about that maybe they did have an oral language maybe it was spoken paleo hebrew we don't fucking know but we do know what they left behind which was more than sufficient as a container 
you know, and it's a time capsule yeah, for what yeah. they viewed as sacred and what they viewed as as necessary to communicate yeah. about yeah. to each other and and whatever through time and you know so so like leaving your mark as this sort of like this is what's important to me and I think we've really lost that with art mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know and the NFT thing is or or perhaps actually I hate to say this but I guess we haven't because. That is what's really worshipped now. Is this like techno morphic, you know, um, this thing of you know, and and I think it really goes hand in hand with the culture of convenience and the culture of sort of like laziness and impatience of like, why should anyone have to learn to do art? Like, we got these programmer nerds, you know, they'll just like make a digitized version of everything, you know. And, and, even, like, and, you know, and the next step of that is, we don't even need the programming nerds. The 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 AI yeah. is mining its own intelligence. It's exactly. farming its own results. It's doing its own thing. Like the thing is totally in place. We don't even need the programmers anymore because, and, and, and without thinking about the programmers, like we have been, that's is much more easy to skip over. And right. Well, and not to damn that we're going deep the, today. <laughs> this is like, we, we went deep. I was going to say, um, it's interesting. You know, a lot of these theories about, um, you know, human again, and this, I'm not coming at this from a religious angle per se, when I say this, um, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of these theories of like, you know, the Anunnaki material and like, you know, humans based on what I know about, you know, bio, there's a lot of lends a lot of credence to that type of stuff. Like just the amount of mutations and sort of like the human genome is really weirdly like sleek. And it's like just strange, you know, we lost, Especially like in Northern Europe, the idea that like my ancestors would have lost all of their, it just doesn't, you know, it's just, anyway. Link down below to Lloyd Pye and all of Lloyd Pye's research. Right. Go on. Uh, but yeah, what I was going to say is like, um, so, you know, is it, it it's, it's, I guess, be, so are we, um, are we biased in thinking that these this artifice, if you will, is a perversion of nature, right? Of like, you know, creating these synthetic means of just obtaining things that used to be so hard to obtain. And, you know, is, is it, is it a uh, losing, losing touch with like the meaning inherent in these things and the, the value, you know, the fact that we, we can mm-hmm. obtain them so easily and that we're working so hard mm-hmm. constantly to be able to obtain them even more easily. Or, is it a necessary step in our evolution um, in the sense that like, I don't know, just, I just thought of this, like going back to that time, like, how do we know, you know, I mean, if you do look at like the Bible and the book of Enoch and stuff and like the, the Noah material, it seems like some weird shit was going on back then that was really reminiscent of this, you know, like really weird shit, like giants and like fucking just, Temple prostitution and blood and orgies then, and, and and then and then genetic you know, manipulation. To far. Then there's the idea that that was not that far back in the past as it was right, seem, which is a right. whole other topic, maybe for all another time. Wait, but uh, you can't just tease me with that. Not that I haven't heard of that, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Well, uh, it's just, I mean, it's just interesting that the like the Fomenko timeline or or like uh, in that. Not familiar with that name necessarily, but just the idea that. You know, you look at pictures of St. Petersburg in the 1830s and 40s. Mm-hmm. Where the hell are all the people? You look at pictures of London yeah. in the 1830s and 40s. Where are all the people? And then like San Francisco. Yeah. Where are all the Where are all the people? What happened? Yeah. What happened 200 years ago? That all these huge cities, full cities. You could see the cityscape and their buildings as far as the eye could see. Like really nice cities. Yeah. Like big, nicer yeah, than like, now. like modern St. Petersburg. I mean many of those buildings despite the war still stand Mm -hmm. and they were there 200 years ago and the city was empty and that was one of many cities as photography was coming of age that was yeah san francisco somebody somebody took the time to get on i don't know if it was knob hill or one of the one of the bluffs in san francisco where you could basically see the whole city and like i think it was like 1938 or uh, sorry 1838 or eight maybe later and now i don't remember off top 1840 that's crazy um and there's a panorama, so it's a series of pictures where they, you know, with the old camera, would get up on the point, take a picture, take the exposure, have to reset up the camera, turn it to the right angle, 
you know, make sure it's all going to line up, do another one. You know, they probably spent half the day doing that, at least a couple hours. And there's not a person in any of the pictures, really. Where are all the people? What happened? So, yeah, and you know, where are all the mud? Why is where how why are these buildings all covered up to their first floor windows with mud or with debris or mud? So they got right. built and then they got covered up. What? Why was that? You know, there, there's I mean, there's a whole there's a whole hmm. that's a whole uh, whole other uh, thing. But you know, was there some sort of global catastrophe thing that happened in the much more recent past that is similar to? the Noah story or was the Noah story? I don't know, but you know, yeah, there's also, it also points to, as far as I understand the geological evidence, there was also some big flood type event, like what? 10,500 BC thereabouts. Right. So, you know, that's uh. anyway, you were talking about Noah and, <laughs> or something. Yeah. Um, no, I just, I guess that my little thing was, was, um, um, how do I articulate this? So if you take this sort of um, this religious mm, mindset that sort of distinguishes between the material, uh, although not all religious people are like this, but I would say the, the more lowbrow, like less sophisticated, you know, because people that study Kabbalah, like they don't look at the world like this at all. You know mm. what I'm saying? Like they're mm. like on another level. But But what I'm, so people that are like, well, that's like, you know, that's holy God stuff, you know, and here we are like these bags of pus and flesh, you know, like that. And there's really, that's really been drilled in particularly through Christianity mm -hmm. and Judaism doesn't really have that element, that, that specific element of like, yeah, it's not a, it's not a, you're a dirty sack of human. It's a little more like nobody's perfect. Come on. You did your best kind of a like. We're all flawed, but it's not like it's just because we all got our little things. So right. But it's also it. like, but, you know, do this thing exactly like this or you'll be fucking destroyed, you know? <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, or whatever. But we can go into that. No, I was going to say, like, just, yeah, the idea that um, if with this whole, like, hmm revamp of you know means of production and the supply chain and mm -hmm. everything you know where it's like people are tired <laughs> like even the engineers are tired like people keep having babies you know like the the people that are living really sloppy often have the most babies for reasons mm -hmm. that i won't plump you know probe <laughs> at the moment um i haven't had any babies just, you know, proud of that. Um, I'll then think of make a great dad. But anyway, yeah, it's like, uh, you know, it, is that, it, it, is that a perversion of nature to try to, I guess what I'm thinking of is, uh, sorry, I know I'm like all over the no, place. No, no, no. I know but you're, you're following. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah. if you look at our body and nature, like nature is all what, yeah, this actually connects really well. All of nature is what they are trying to engineer, which is self-perpetuating machines and systems. Like, that's what all of this is, you know, like uh, the other day, you know, I, um, like I screwed up my mucous membranes in my throat. My body was like, I see a problem. I'm going to send you some signals. Like you need to lie the fuck down, stop talking. You need to drink warm shit. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a fever and a chill, like, you know, but again, for the, for me, at least the mindset is totally different because if you, if your mindset is like, Oh no, some malevolent intruder, mm -hmm. you know, like I was just living my life, you know, and, and some, some evil particle got in me and it was like, I'm going to wreak havoc because I'm a fucking monster, you know? And, and there's nothing I can do. And hopefully somebody, you know, lab coat comes along and saves me or hopefully right. I can I just pray need to and chug and, Advil and, yeah. uh, and, and, or yeah, yeah. With whatever the commercial told me to get this product or that product based on if you got this symptom or that symptom. Yeah, sure. So yeah, so I don't know. It's just it's just interesting that like, you know, like the body, our body being of nature, maybe like again, maybe it was engineered. Maybe it was improved or <laughs> deproved upon, right? Like it maybe it was tinkered with, but it still is of nature and it does what nature does, where nature strives for homeostasis and, and balance and this sort of state of like 
keeping life moving and balancing things out and and every form of life every expression of consciousness and and natural you know life trying to perpetuate perpetuate itself and sort of stay integrated into this larger system and i think that maybe partially because we as a species, you know, again, let's say we were tinkered with, you know, we have gone far outside the natural sort of like, you know, we, we've almost, we've dissociated a little bit from our environment, you know, and I mm -hmm. think, uh, I think like high fashion and like the art scene, like art basil is like the epitome of that. And the NFT thing, um, you know, because it's like, I don't know. Where's the, where's the gratitude? You know? And again, like, I'm, I don't mean like the, like, Oh, you know, heavenly father, like it is only by your mercy. Like we humbly beseech you like that, not that kind of gratitude, but like the, like, I know what sustains me. I know what it makes sense to be grateful for, because in that sense, gratitude is just an acknowledgement and uh, an awareness of like how things work and what, you know, mm -hmm. what your needs are and, and, and of life itself of life itself. Yeah. And so, yeah. And I, anyway, that was quite the odyssey, but I feel like you understand where I'm going no. with this. Yeah, I guess absolutely. What, my final point is like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a frenetic laziness. I think at the, at the heart of this, of like not wanting to change our ways because we, we, we tell ourselves a story that we've progressed so far, you know, and yeah. we, we've, We've generated so many things from this highly egoic place. And the more we we come from that place, almost by definition, the more out of balance with nature we get. Because nature's like, look, there's a lot of stuff, you know, at play here. You know, like I I don't think nature perceives egos like that at all. You know, it's like, I mean, yeah, I guess you're you, but like you're you're in this environment, you know, you're doing your thing. You're like a you know, is it I I think to nature, it's like, well, you're a body, like you're a cell, you're like a galaxy, if galaxies are real, whatever, whatever, you know, like you're, you're a, a nucleus with some shit orbiting it, you know, or you're the shit orbiting the nucleus, like was this whole idea of like ego or identity. And so I think the more we create from that place of like, really uh, assigning reality to the ego. And I think the rise of corporations and corporatism is really like the, the, the final act of this in a way, you know, because it's like, you're, and that definitely is like very, uh, much a perversion of, you know, and I'm sure you know all about that. Like the, the corp yeah. making this dead entity that has the same rights as a human being, you know, what yeah. does that say about actual living human beings and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but basically, yeah. So it's like, and you see two waves now, right? You see the people that are like, okay, this shit's gone too far. Like, I'm going to take a course on homesteading, you know, and and uh, permaculture design, right? And then you see the people that are like, well, if we can just, you know, like Bill Gates, like if we can just buy up all the farmland and create vertical farms that are creating cockroach milk and seitan protein, then, you know, we can... You know, we can just keep going and, you know, as, as I can, you know, I can. And I can finally block out the sun. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, I'll, I'll keep my, my you know, backroom deal with Monsanto and, like, it'll all be peachy. Like, you know, just not, like, clinging, white knuckling to this thing that, like, is not working. And I think ultimately that does have to do with conscience. You know, although I, I was saying the other day, like, I do believe that all these, quote, unquote, evil people think that they are, they have the right intentions you know everyone always does everything with this like fucking self-righteousness yeah. you know yeah. what i mean no one's like yes and then and that that's i think that goes i think that speaks to why you would almost ne ne necessarily have to use the bloodline because you need to be able to you can't just hopefully you get the next psychopath you can just find them on the street to, to keep the legacy on you got to have a kid and you got to be a psychopath and you got to raise that kid to be a psychopath. And easiest way to do that is to keep it in the family. But yeah, yeah, well and 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 I guess now, you know, raise that kid as a different gender from the get-go. <laughs> right, right, That's right. like a big Have you yeah, seen a well, photo of Jared confused. Kushner? Jared Kushner. Dude. No, I don't think I know who that is. The name sounds familiar, but Wait, are you serious? Yeah. Jared Kushner? <laughs> the name man sounds vaguely familiar, but I don't know who that is. He is Trump's son-in-law. 
Oh, okay. All right. He's, That's why the name sounds he, familiar. He is all of the muscle behind Trump. Like my father okay. is actually, okay. actually visiting soon, um, who like just knows a lot. He's like, he's like me. He's a collector, if you will. Mm-hmm. Like, he knows a lot, reads a lot. And it's always great to get his perspective because he doesn't live in the U.S. and he never has, you know? So it's always good to get those people's perspective. Mm-hmm. Not that that perspective is perfect, but, you know, again, in the, you know, in reading between the lines of all perspectives, you start to be able to populate mm-hmm. a more complete list of what's actually going on. Uh, one time we were talking about politics or whatever. Because every time he visits here, like, we go to this, like, f- weird friends and family party up in Connecticut. And uh, he's going again, actually, this year. I'm I'm just tired. I'm like, I've had enough Russian people for a lifetime. I mean, I know I love Russian people, but like my family, I'm like, listen, you guys do your thing. Like, I'm, I'm chilling. Uh, but yeah, so he, we, I was talking to him in the car and I was like, yo, you know, Trump, blah, 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 blah. And he was like, Trump. He was like, what about Jared Kushner? And I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I just kind of like, I, I acknowledged that and he was like, you don't know. He was like, Trump is nothing. He was like, Jared Kushner is like, like he's one of the most powerful men in the world. Like, like clearly Trump is taking orders and this whole right, right, right. Facade, okay. charade act of he's like, the, oh. he's the, uh, what was he's the front name? facing. Not well, Cheney. Also, Who was the other guy? That other fat guy. Oh, fat guys. Cheney. What the hell is his name? <laughs> They made that Bush's brain movie, Carl Rove. He's uh, always like the Carl Rove or something right. for Trump. Well, right, and well, plus or, Trump or, is or a, whatever. Trump is a Gemini, so like, <laughs> you know, it just makes so much sense that they would, you know, it's like this, like really, like personality, like charismatic, like face. That, the, but anyway, yeah, my dad was like, Jared Kushner is like a terrifying human being. You know, or like insert mm. noun here. He's a terrifying right. blank because it's mm. unclear. There's this photo of him. And you know how these people, they love to shove things in our face. Yes. They really like the, I, and the older I get, the more I'm like, wow, you just really can't get enough of this, can you? They really can't. You know, yeah, the, and I, I guess else. it's, yeah. And it, well, I've, I've heard that like that's how they harvest occult energy. Like when they and reveal killers, something and serial killers take tokens, keep body parts, do, you know, there's all sorts of different ways to do that. And they've yeah. got it, they've got it ritualized where some random serial killers just kind of hobbling, you know, stumbling in the dark, but essentially comes up with something similar. Yeah. So they got to do it. They got to talk anyway, about it. They got to return to the scene, whatever. There's this photo of Jared Kushner on the cover of Time magazine. Okay. And he does not if you yeah, if you want to look it up, I, I you gotta look it up. I'm sorry. He looks it like it is beyond obvious that that is not a man. It's just obvious. Like his hips, the way his hips look, and like it was my friend Mel. I know I keep bringing her up, but uh she, that she's the one that pointed this out to me, or I guess she had Someone else had shown it to her, but she, she she's the one that brought it up. She was like, because she's all, you know, she's really into like the, she's like a scholar of all this sort of trans stuff mm-hmm. and everything. So she was like, like her life has been affected a lot by this whole situation you know so she she's very hypersensitive to that stuff or you know we'll be walking down the street in Philly and I'm like I'm like, is that a guy or a girl? She's like, well, are you kidding me? That's clearly a woman, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, damn, I guess your, your gender is a lot more <laughs> on point than mine. Like, I don't know. But I sometimes I, I'm just like, I can't tell. Like, nowadays, there's just, you, you know, people are putting so much effort into confusing the fuck out of you. Like, mm-hmm. it's not as easy as it once was. So she's really attuned to that stuff. And she was like, the way that his hands fall like the plate that's like a big thing apparently with mm-hmm. men and women is mm-hmm. men tend to have longer arms um like it's you know and like everything else in nature it's a ratio but like so basically like men's arms where they fall on the hips the shape of the hips and stuff and yeah if you look at that photo yeah that just does well, not look like a man at all see and and here's the thing that that i can and i've heard people say ivanka is a man 
the the way that the arms hang, yeah, I mean that's something that as a former actor that that's that's a pretty 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 easy kind of little thing to to effeminize, but it's tough from just one time cover because I kind of recognize them, but without much more context, like for example, the the trim of his the line of his coat around his under his rib cage and how tight that is, and the way that his pants hang and make his thighs and hips look bigger, that makes him look a lot more womanly, and that could have all been done after the photo shoot or as part of the whole costume design. So you never, that's the tough thing about time magazine. They're so fucking corrupt and you don't know how many levels they're playing at one time, but I definitely understand what you're saying. They're trying to present an androgen on that magazine for sure. Yeah. If nothing else, that's extremely androgynous. Yeah. Yeah. Down to the makeup, down to the makeup, down to the way that he's holding his head and the camera level. I mean, the camera level is. Yeah. It's like navel. Right his, yeah. It's right at the, it's so if it's a men, usually you, you, the camera level will be closer to the chest or shoulders with women. It's closer to the uterus. I mean, that's right. a ten, it, it, It's not that it, it, it makes the person seem more masculine or feminine, feminine. That's all I'm saying. That's a There's really all good these point. tricks about Thank how to that. frame things, and you know, okay, if you're playing a man playing a woman, how do you act on stage? How do you frame that person? What do the clothes look like? All that stuff. So there's all these little tricks into making that. And so again, you're right. But the thing about they're putting this right out in our faces is the crazy thing is you never know how many levels they're playing at once. How much, you know. It, how much is wrapped into this narrative? What are they trying to say? And I don't have any real context on Jared Kushner, but there's definitely something to that. Yeah. And there's definitely that androgen or, or uh, feminization of his image. It's well, he image also has, of- he has a feminine looking face and I think, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. I mean, whatever, we don't have to keep talking yeah. about this, but I I'll do think a picture. there's a lot of these like really tall women in like in these positions now, like whether it's Ivanka or whether it's mm. Melinda Gates or like, you know, I was going to say Michelle Obama, but I, my, the, my gender yeah. consistency with women doesn't really add up. So men with women, women with men, fish right. with fish. It's like a giant <laughs> restaurant out there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, I don't know how many more of these I should. Let's see. Well, oh, this I, is yeah. real quick. Real quick, just to, to I really like that idea of art as a voodoo doll. Yeah, I almost think that at this point, and it might have been you know the voodoo doll for mass consciousness, but at this point, it's almost the voodoo doll for ma- the mass subconscious. Like, how far can right. we prick? How much fucked up shit can we put in front of them and just right. fuck with their psyches because they they're looking at these. You know, uh, what's that lady that that was? I think she's a uh, Serb, not maybe not Serbian, but from the Marina uh, Abramovic. Yeah, Marina Abramovic. Uh, uh, sure, her too. Um, there's another one that does the. I don't know. Maybe she's Polish or something. Anyway, there's another one too. But yeah, that that type. How much can we put those people's art in the front? How many fucking paintings with red shoe children in red shoes can we put out mm. on? You know, there was that art installation last year. I don't know if you saw it. I think it was in Milan. Uh, probably September last year, maybe. Don't quote me on that. But it was all this like kids in cages, and it was like a public art installation, like on billboards next to the highway and all over. I think it was Milan or somewhere in northern Italy. And it was just like they put it up, and then it was like three weeks later, they got enough people like, What the fuck are you doing that they took it all down? But it was an art installation paid for by the city and put on billboards and stuff. And it's just like, So it's this how many, how many pins like that can they prick into the voodoo doll that is our mass subconscious? That's what that made me think of. So I really like that image though of, I mean, it's a fucked up image, but perverting art to turn it into the voodoo doll to. Ugh. Right. It's, a, it's, well, it's an image. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's uh 
But anyway, do, what was your? Do we want to go to the next? Uh... Yeah, sure. Um, I'm. Yeah, I was going to say my. I, I'm experiencing pain, so maybe I'll just like say the thing, and then you like f- sort of like springboard off of it. All right, and we'll keep it. You know, we'll, I won't keep you too long then. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, so, well, yeah. That was the reason I. You know, because I'm using my judgment. I think I have the one last one on here might be for like the next episode because I have a lot of like add on material that I actually wrote down the other day that would just dovetail really well with it. But this Perfect. dovetails really well with what we've been working um, with already and the NFT stuff, which is um, the idea that, and I'll give an example for from my own life. So uh, before I had a smartphone, my memory was so good. Like my memory for digits and like strings of, of words was like really, I mean, I also have a little bit of like a photographic memory with regard to things like, you know, if I'm looking at a science textbook or something, like I really can retain that stuff. Well, especially if it's interesting to me, but Mm -hmm. and then when I started interacting with screens on this chronic basis to the point where you consult it for everything, I just noticed that my working memory and, you know, this stuff really started to kind of like go away. And the the epitome of this is, and I, I guess I open this part up to you, maybe just like nod or shake your head. Um, when you open up a search engine and just the act of seeing that blank search engine screen, you're like, uh, it's like when you walk into a room and you're like, what mm-hmm. did I go into this room for? And you, and it's, it's like overwhelm through too many possibilities and also mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. overwhelm through. And I think, I think with the search engine, I think it's because if, if search suggestions never existed, that problem would not exist either. It wouldn't be as pervasive because it's like, if you, that's how evolution works. That's how the mind works. It's how everything works in nature. It's like, if you have to put in the effort to do something, yeah, then you will. Simple as that. If you don't, then it's like, well, I mean, yeah, uh, it seems like it's fine to let this atrophy because now it's being done for me, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that's and that's a very sort of capricious way that I think they've been able to engineer people. If you really go, d- d- you know, deep into that rabbit hole, you know, especially with this like medical situation, you know, like if you start typing in, you know, a certain word that starts with V and ends with S, you know, it's <laughs> always like are safe are effective you know and like the amount of you have to put in and for those of you it rhymes with maxine right exactly um and so but yeah so so and and with regard to the nft thing i guess like because i think one of the best ways of perverting things and this goes back to the well this is actually tying in really nicely now the whole religion piece the best way to pervert something and pervert communication is to install permanently install a middleman right because then the natural communication just gets all fucked up because people are like oh well i can only present it this certain way because the middleman says or the middleman will only accept which you know and the 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 means of communication and the symbol language that is that arises from natural free exchange of ideas uh and natural free communication is just so much more fluid and effective and unrestricted and you know less contrived and so anyway yeah the thing that i had in there was screens and interacting with technology that does all these things for us erodes our creativity on a fundamental level it it, because it but also just to go the one level higher i definitely believe that what we visualize becomes our reality and i think that's been proven like fucking time and time again you know whether you want to go you know joseph mercola like there's just so many there's you know take your pick there's so many books you can open up to and read that all sort of really drill that point you know of like you know what you what you visualize you literally are like you know you are the valve that that is Mm -hmm. sort of funneling that image into your reality you know and they, they you know uh there's studies on how perception doesn't observe reality. It creates it, you know? And, uh, but anyway, so I just think it's really interesting because if they want us to have less power and less of a say in this reality and how it works and, uh, 
you know, the types of things that are allowed to sort of take place, then that's a great way of doing it, of installing this middleman, this inorganic, weird scrying mirror thing that like, and now, and I, again, I, I have a really personal um, bone to pick with this because now it's like, I just want to like paint and draw. You know, I don't want to use a screen. I don't. I really, really don't. I don't like it. I don't like being in front of a screen. Um, you know, I don't, I just don't like any of it. It's not the same, you know, and it is easier. And I don't like that. I don't like, <laughs> I don't like that, you know, because it's just not the same. And so this idea of like, well, you know, digital art is the next big thing. And like, you got to do this. And, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to stay relevant and all, all the things, you know, then you have to do this. You have to accept this, you know, and it, that's very, uh, to me, it's, it's very like crusades, you know, it's very inquisition on that level of like, well, no, you have to accept this, this wave, like, like, otherwise you're just excommunicated from any and, kind of, and that goes right back to what we were talking about at the beginning. It goes back to, okay, the, you need to be doing this. Okay. Why? Because that's what people want to see. How do you know people want to see that? Because that's what the algorithm is telling us that people want to see. Or that's what the, the democratically we as an art community got together and decided on, you know, whatever it is. So what you want us to produce is a simulacrum of what you think people want to see. Is that really giving the artist the ability to communicate a human truth? <laughs> or is it mer uh, uh, marketing, like you were saying? So that ties in very nicely there. Uh, a deeper level, to your point on memory and having things that, that act, as, act as proxy uh, um, memory devices for us, not only is this something that it happens now with the technology and the screens and the Google searches and whatnot, but in cultures that were pre-written uh, language, uh, in places like New Guinea, they didn't have a written language. They had an oral tradition, they had an oral language, but they didn't have a written language. And then they were brought into kind of, you know, contacted by the Western world for the first time in the 1940s. And within a generation, they were able to write and read. And yet, their oral tradition and the general memory of those types of cultures drops off a cliff immediately, partially because you don't need to remember it, you can write it down. So, yeah, it's kind of good, kind of bad, but it does, you know, or maybe it's not kind of it's a mixed bag, depending on how you look at it, maybe, but it definitely speaks to your point that if you have something to remember it for you, you spend less time cultivating that memory center in your brain to do that because you just trust that you have this external thing that will do it for you. So again, kind of a mixed bag. But the deeper level and probably the deepest level and to tie all this back up comes to, so what does that look like in allegorical terms? If you were to talk about an alleg allegory for something like Google search that holds your memories for you, or gives you a, you know, you open up the white light of the Google home. It's just a blank white light brought to you by Google. And you could say that light was brung to you by Google, that Google bore that light unto you, that Google was the light bearer, right? And in <laughs> the biblical tradition, that name is usually Luke's Farai, Luke's Fare or Lucifer. So this, the allegory of Lucifer has to do with that. I'm not saying that Lucifer is the, uh, when people lose oral tradition, that that's Luciferian or something, but um, the idea that having the middleman like Google, the light is out there. You can turn and look and interact with it and see it yourself. Reality, light, whatever the allegory is, nature, truth, all of that is out there for you to discover. The problem is when you allow somebody else to say, no, let me bring it to you. Let me bring you the light. You don't need somebody to bring you the light. You can observe it. We have the ability to do that. That's our part of this physical form that we have and all these, you know, senses and, you know, not the five, just the five senses, but all of the sensations and all of the different energetic uh, fields on which we interact. 
you don't need to have a proxy to have those experiences. And when you do, you run the risk of having that light bringer bringing you something that's not truth, that's not light, that's not what you actually need. And you don't know it because you've now forgotten how to do it yourself because you've handed that over to another outside memory source that you're trusting will be there when you need it. And so the whole idea of doing your own thing and figuring out and earning your own way and owning what you earn, earn it to own it, you know, all of that, as soon as that starts to, to get, you let that go and, and allow some other entity to take care of that for you, you run the risk. I'm not saying it's going to happen 100 times out of 100. You run the risk of allowing that proxy to to kind of uh, manipulate that, 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 that control point. So that is how I would wrap it all up. And I think that that, you know, there's how I would tie it in, not necessarily wrapping it up, but how I would tie it into some of the other things we're talking about. And as far as art goes, you know, that's the whole thing. Are you going out and finding what you think is interesting? Are you having the experience or are you letting sitting there and letting the billboard top 40 tell you what experience you should be having? Are you allowing the Billboard Top 40 or Google, you know, suggested search to bring back the truth that you need or well, whatever experience you're supposed to have in this moment? And, and really, every all the mainstream platforms are going this way and have been going this way for a while. You know, like really everything that's like free and a lot of people use, it's always because even, it might not necessarily. I mean, it is ads. It's always ads. Right. Mm -hmm. But even if it's not ads. It's something. It's always like, oh, and they, right, and they use that time that you are indisposed or preoccupied. Like, you know, let's say you put on, you know, a video on YouTube, you know, or you have the Spotify on in the background. You know, it's like it always. It's like the machinations in the background. You know, like you're like, you know, uh, your your pot of coffee is ready, so you're pouring it, and the song happens to have just ended, and Spotify is like, well, I know that you said you wanted to listen to this album, but you know. I've been paying attention to every single fucking thing you've done on this platform since you started using it. And I think maybe you'd really enjoy this other song. And I really am interested to see no whether you will enjoy that other song. Yeah. No matter how many times you thumb this down Nickelback, Spotify will still play it. Right. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. And, it's and you know, whether it's Spotify or YouTube or yeah. whatever, you know, it's like... Yeah. Um, and I think I wanted to save this. For, yeah, I'll save this. this okay. It, I well, I'll, I'll say this break. on that because there is something, and I don't do it that much anymore. But like in 2012 and 2013, around then when YouTube was still kind of kicking, I used to do this thing, and I'll do it occasionally, but not very much anymore because the algorithm. But I used to do this thing called YouTube Mancy, where I would just kind of like find a video and then just let it keep going through the suggested things. And this is back in the day where it was more like you would get actually things that were related instead of like, oh, this is your third video and now it's Fox News time or whatever. Like, what the fuck? But, uh, you know, you haven't seen Joe Biden in 10 seconds. So let's make sure we put it. What? I didn't... Anyway, um, but it was always interesting to see. It was interesting at the time to see how, you know, you'd start with one thing and pretty soon you'd be down the rabbit hole where people are, you know, claiming they have non-doctored photographs of Nibiru or Planet X or whatever. And it's just like, man, this is the fourth video like this I've seen. Still not sold. Still not sold. Oh, what's next? Okay, now we got, you know, whatever. Uh, but that was always kind of an interesting uh, exercise, but certainly not something I would encourage now because or you'd have to almost do it as like a, like a, let's see how fucking crazy the algorithm is, maybe from that standpoint. But I see that a lot with the ads. Like, there's a very demonic influence at play. Like the more I'm trying to get it, YouTube specifically, the more I'm trying to get in the zone, like I'm trying to do something meditative or like I'm putting mm, on like really mm, like interesting. I'm trying to achieve a vibe. Like the music is like really, really like high frequency and then YouTube, like, like the like demons or fallen angels at the helm of the YouTube algorithm are like, He's getting too close to the God force. Like, and they'll just throw in like some like fucking ad with this like emaciated baby, just like deformed. And I'm like, damn, like you guys really don't like this. Like, 
this like Gregor, this the, you guys really don't like the Gregorian chants, huh? Like, you know what I mean? Like they really, they, it's like specific things will trigger it where they're like, no, like we have to knock them out of this state, you know? And it's really just mm-hmm. weird, you know? It's like, it seems more mild unless you, you go into specific things and then it's like active discouragement. And I think in 2012, 2013, that wouldn't have been nearly as prominent, yeah. if at all. Yeah. And the, and the thing about the, you know, it kind of goes back into the whole gender identity, politic, whatever thing is that it's another kind of like, just kind of having to, you know, let's just throw something, keep you off balance. You're not really sure what's going to come next. And, and, you know, just that general kind of repeated disruption um, is unsettling. I know it's talked about uh, who wrote the, all the stuff on, on crowd mob mentality and like the, 20s and 30s and 40s i can't remember his name but he talked about like how uh uh uncertainty is one of the most like as far as mob mentality goes when you introduce uncertainty like changing uncertainty like not just like we're not we're not sure what's going on right now but like we're never sure what's going on like that really disrupts the whole ability of that group to work together in any coherent sort of a way that's really interesting. I definitely see that, you know, especially, you know, if you look at that quote from that dude from the CIA who said, like, I don't know, like the 50s or 60s, he was like, when when everything the American public believes is false, you know, our job will be done, you know, and it's well, like, yeah, William we are, we're there. I mean, I don't think yeah. that's too big of a statement to, you know, we, we by and large, mm-hmm. we're there, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, and, and, and you know, to, to sort of like the, the example of that is the fact that like, even in our community, you know, there's always like all these weird red herrings, you know, and it's like, there's mm-hmm. always like a, another polarity, just doesn't even matter which one is real, just to confuse you, just to take away that certainty and that drive, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you really think that, you know, the Anunnaki came and it's like, bam, flat earth, like all this evidence, for that. you know what I mean? Like, what the fuck are you going to do now? You know what I yep. mean? And you're just like, well, I don't really know. I thought I, you know, it's, and it's, I think that's, that's really one of the most disempowering things ever. And that's why, you know, I really feel strongly that, you know, the internet, I think the internet can be used for good, but I think for the most part right now it's being used for evil because yeah. there's just so much, and the uh, same can be said about art uh, to a degree, at least. And I would say that the the, the underlying difference maker is not the tool. And it's not necessarily even the person using the tool in the case of something like the internet or in right. the case of something like art. If you have the ability to observe whatever that is with a slightly dispassionate uh, slightly cynical aware and slightly critical eye you're going to understand something greater than whatever lie was trying to be packaged to you because critical thinking is so good at discovering truth that it can even find greater truths in lies and like you were saying earlier it reveals if you come at it from that angle or that place, it reveals something or many somethings about the intentions of the person curating that experience for you. Exactly. That is, I think is exactly, that's why critical thinking is the antidote to so much of this, you know, because I, I mean, when I start to like my family and stuff, you know, they're like, but how, why would they do this? You know, or like so many people would have to be in on it. It's like, look, there's several reasons why I can't address those points or answer those questions for you. And namely, like, I'm going to get really worked up. I just don't have the energy and patience <laughs> yep. to sit down with you. Like, maybe if it was someone other than someone that close to me, I'd be like, well, actually, you may not know this, but yeah, like these people have an agenda. I'm like, here, I'll give it to you point by point. But when it's my family, I'm like, you need to get this now. Like, but yep. I think... Yeah, just tweaking that that uh, that modality of how you take things in, you know, versus like, yeah, like just literally like it's very it's very rapey, you know, because uh-huh. the middleman the, the middleman is like, you know, yeah, trust me, you know, like it'll be great, you know, just 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 fully trust me, like literally like leave your discernment at the door, and I'll take care of everything. 
you know? I don't remember what the play or movie it was. I think it was in a play, but it might have been in a movie. But there is a line, and the line is, and it wasn't rape because I didn't say no, but I also, but I didn't say yes either. And I think that's what we're talking about. It's these yeah. these ideas are being foisted down your down into your brain, not because you're not actively trying to stop them. You're not saying no. Most people are not saying no, but they're also not really saying yes. They're just turning their TV on. And I think that speaks to your earlier point. I don't remember, or the, or what I remember from an earlier point that you made, where you were talking about art interacting with the conscious mind versus the subconscious yeah. mind. And I yeah. think it's really interesting because I think a lot of this Renaissance stuff and this Christian art, I think that was more interacting with the conscious mind because it's a consciously recollected story in these biblical images, you know, to the extent that the person has all of the knowledge about that, which I think people did more back then versus now all this satanic shit, you know, and if they do put Christian symbolism into stuff like people, most people don't know any of that, but it is in the subconscious. It is in the collective psyche. And, mm. and that goes result, back to that's the, there's that subconscious is what's the, 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 the voodoo doll there, you know, that's, right. that's, that's what's going on. And I think it's also what's, well, that's interesting too, because in a sense, this algorithm, right? This singularity, mm -hmm. I think the end goal of this is to actually install like a phantom subconscious. If you think about it, because it is, it's very much like, you know, these search engine suggestions, you know, it's a very, uh, it's something you don't think about, right? I mean, that's just a great way of, of, of hashing it out. Mm -hmm. What is what is the subconscious? What is subconscious? Well, it's stuff that that it's the autopilot stuff, you know, like your subconscious is what runs your body. You know, you're not like, okay, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna beat my heart now, in, out, in, out, you know, your liver, you're, liver, liver, I'm livering. I gotta exactly. kind of concentrate. <laughs> You're not like, okay, activate apocrine sweat glands yeah. now, you know, yeah. that, that doesn't yeah. happen. So that's your subconscious. But also when you're interacting with Google or whatever, hopefully you're never interact with Google. But when you're interacting with one of these search engines and you're typing and the suggestions come down, you don't think about that. You don't think about, oh, why is this happening? And you probably don't even think about like, whoa, am I being manipulated? Or like, oh, that one sounds good. You just, you know, it's like. It's in front of you. You know, it's like when you're mm -hmm. at the grocery store and you're mm -hmm. you're you're picking out fruit. It's like, oh, that one looks good. But you don't you don't think that. You just sort of Or even even in the grocery store when you're like, that looks good based on the picture on the box. Right. Because that's what the Google search is. It's a picture on a box. Well, and but right. I meant even like if you're picking out produce, right? And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, this is a nice banana, but it's not, you're not thinking, oh, that's a nice banana. Oh, okay. Now sure, I'm sure. going to select saying. that one. It's more of a subconscious body sense of like, gotcha. I yeah. want that one. I yeah. want that. And I think with the search engine suggestions, it's similar because it's it's sort of – it's suggesting to you – and this is really insidious. What it's really suggesting to you is maybe you had more that you were going to type in, but maybe this is what you're after. Mm -hmm. Maybe this thing that I only now just put in front of you that you would not have typed in – is what you're after. And so mm. it's recommending or suggesting goals. Mm -hmm. It's recommending or suggesting desires. And I think the perfect example of that is the trans thing. I really do. Because I'm sorry, but you cannot convince me that there would be people in droves doing this thing that it is just... It's just not something that would ever come out of nature. You know, it's, it has to be engineered, you know, and it's like um, they wouldn't be doing this unless all of these desires and behaviors were suggested to them. You know, and then I could get into the whole thing of like belonging and, you know, fitting in. And obviously that's a huge piece of it. But just, yeah, just the idea that like critical thinking is the antidote to so much of this. And I think critical thinking really transmutes a lot of that subconscious content, whether it's coming from someone else, whether it's trying to fuck with your subconscious, whether it's coming from your own subconscious. And that's why this stuff is so getting so popular now with like the biofeedback and just becoming aware of, of things you're not normally aware of. Because if you can make the subconscious conscious, that kind of it, that really is what ascension is because yeah. you're taking these more base animal components and you actually bring them up to the surface where you're able to decide like, 
do I, am I pleased that this is something I'm doing? Do I want this to be a part of how I interact with the world? You know, or can I use that sort of higher mind, you know, whatever that higher self to, to, to make a, an executive decision that like, I don't really like that, you know? And it's, so I do think that this is like definitely a planned intrusion into our minds uh, into how we make decisions and into definitely most disturbingly for me, our desires. Um, and the next episode, I have a whole bunch to say about that. That's going to be great. Um, but, but I won't, I won't right. mention that topic. Yeah, no, that's, that's that. We'll tease it there. That'll give something people to look forward to. Give something for me to look forward to at least. Um, and yeah, I think uh, I think that's probably a good place to leave it for now. Definitely.